Awesome. We have folks coming from Centennial. Thank you for joining. We have high school teachers here. We have students. What other schools are represented? We have Centennial High School. Oh, we have a choir teacher. Welcome. St. Helens, Oregon, assistant principal. This is awesome. Aloha High School in the building. Beaverton High School. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, representing VHS. So we know we have teachers, we have faculty and staff, we have students. We also have community members, family members. How are we all connected? East Orient School, David Douglas. This is awesome. Yes, I love to see it. Okay, we are going to be getting started, I would say, in just one more minute. We'll go ahead and jump in soon with introductions. Feel free to put in the chat what your favorite color is. <laughs> Okay, so just a uh, heads up to everyone, we will have our senators joining us at 3 p.m. Um, and shortly we will be reviewing some slides to learn a little bit more about what senators do and who they are. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, I go to BHS and I'm a senior. Hi, I'm Tanya. I am a junior at Beaverton High School. And hello everyone, my name is Esther and I am a Youth Essentials Coordinator and I, my work site is Beaverton High School. So we wanna thank everyone for joining us again. Um, Michael's gonna go ahead and give us a couple of uh, pointers about what our protocol will be for conversations. We're definitely gonna take questions, but when can people expect to have those questions answered? Um, yeah, uh, well, towards like the end, after um, all the senators are done, uh, we'll do a Q&A where we'll be able to ask questions for the signers. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. And as you all can see, I hope on your screens, we have some slides now that we're going to show you just to give a little bit of background information about what the U.S. Senate is and what our senators do and who they are as they will be joining us soon. So... <laughs> Hi, um, the, UN, the U.S. Senate is the upper chamber of the United States Congress, which along the House of Representatives, the low chamber, low chamber um, constitutes and legislators. I'm chopping it up, my bad. Um, the Senate chamber is located in the north wing of the Capitol building in the Washington, D.C. Okay. So senators serve for six years. They must be at least 30 years old. They must be a citizen of the United States for at least nine years. And there are two senators per state. Uh, one of the senators that we'll be talking today is uh, Jeff um, Mer Mer Mercury. Um, he has a bachelor's at Stanford University. Um, he graduated from his graduate degree 
Mm -hmm. is from Princeton University. Um, he was elected in 2009 and his political party is Democrat. Our second senator who will be joining us is Senator Ron Wyden. Uh, his bachelor's is in political science from Stanford University. His law degree is from the University of Oregon. He was elected in 1996 and he is a Democrat. Yes, go Ducks. And as always, we just wanna take a moment to extend a special thank you to our student hosts, Michael and Tanya. They have been doing a phenomenal job and we're really thankful to have them doing such an amazing leadership role here. So we can give them a virtual round of applause. This takes courage. This takes boldness to get up here and do this. So we definitely want to say thank you. Thank you, Esther. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm, I'm proud of you guys. <laughs> All right. So thank you once again to everyone who is joining us here today. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Tanya and Michael again. We'll be having our senators join us in just about six minutes now. Um, I'm gonna pass it to you guys. Should we ask them to start answering these questions? Yeah. All right, so meanwhile, we wait for the six minutes. Um, hopefully you have thought of some questions that you'd like to ask our senator and you can write them down in the chat or just start thinking of them while we wait. Thank you. Um, there are some conversation protocols that I have to go over. Uh, first one is mute your mic. Uh, students are welcome to write their name and unmute and ask questions at the end of our event when called upon. We will let you know when that will happen. Um, firstly, the most important part is uh, have a positive and appropriate conversation about the topics in the chat. Uh, this is our platform. Youth voice is what the world needs right now. Uh, please be respectful. Uh, disagree with ideas, not people. And uh, please ask questions. So we have about five minutes before our senators should be joining us. Um, so I welcome you even now. You can start thinking about your questions and adding them to the chat. We will be keeping an eye on our chat box and uh, keeping tabs on your questions for our later portion of the show. Um, so any questions you might have about education, um, we'll be getting into topics about workforce and mental health. So any questions that you might have for a, a U.S. Senator who represents us here in Oregon, what might you ask? These are things that you can ask the chat. Write down the I think so. Nice, we have a comment in the chat. I love the pumpkin on your table. Do you know where I can get one like that? That is a great question. We actually have these beautiful pumpkin succulent uh, table garnishes that we're giving away for free. Um, as well as uh, some Jamba Juice gift cards that will be going to, I believe it was the first five students that logged on will be getting these. Um, but we have plenty to give away. So these are some of the gifts that will be given away to folks. How's your day been? <laughs> yes, I hope everyone's having a great day. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. 
Question. So from the chat, we have a question for our host. How has the beginning of the school year been for you? This has obviously been a very different school year. Yeah. <laughs> How has it been for you so far? Um, for me personally, uh, it's all right. It has its benefits of not having to wake up super early to take the bus to school, um, but also the social interactions at school were kind of good, which is what I miss. But besides that, um, it's been pretty well. How about you, Tanya? Um, it's been interesting. It seems like it's a choice to wake up every morning, but nope, we're still doing this. And I think we all got this. If not, you can always rely on someone to help you out. There's always going to be someone. Yeah, I would love to hear how it is for our other students in this call as well. This has been um, a very different school year. So we're curious to hear how you've been doing, how you've been navigating this. Kaylee says, that's a great outlook, Tanya. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. And just a reminder, if you haven't noticed in the chat, um, students, please post your name and school in the chat so we can take attendance for prizes. Post any questions that you might have along with your name so we can answer them at the end of the show. All right, it is three o'clock now. I'm not sure if we, it looks like we have one senator on. Hi, greetings, folks. Welcome, Senator Merkley. Thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. My name is Tanya and I go to Beaverton High School. Yeah. I'm currently a senior. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Michael. Uh, I go to Beaverton High School and I'm a senior. And hello, once again, I'm Esther. I am a Youth Essentials Coordinator here for REIT. Okay. So there we have a special guest. Yeah. Sorry. Senator Jeff Merkley and Senator Ron Wyden, who represents us in Oregon and the United States of America, um, to listen and engage in the discussion about education, mental health, and work, and to keep job security. Yeah. So now we have some questions that we are going to be posing to our senators. So I'll take a look at it. What is one of the most recent bills that you have voted on that you're most proud of? Well, hi, greetings, everyone. Are we ready to, you want me to just jump right on in? Yeah. Okay, well. Words, you can also uh, do a greeting and a welcome. We're so glad to have you. And then feel free to um, jump in on that question. Well, I'm absolutely uh, pleased to join you all for the discussion of, of, of this variety of issues that you, you're, you're planning to raise on healthcare and, and education and, and so forth. And in terms of just kicking it off for a, a, a single bill that's, that's passed recently, I was, um, I'm, I've been very interested in human rights around the world. 
And one of the things that has happened is China has been really making life difficult for the people living in Hong Kong, which has had a, a separate system, a very open political system, but China started to shut that down. And the, the, the bill was part of a pair of bills that supported human rights in Hong Kong. And my piece of it specifically, my bill, uh, said that the U.S. will stop exporting any kind of crowd control equipment. So it was a very substantive. Um, no, we are we are saying that the the police are are wrong in Hong Kong. Uh, they're attacking the peaceful protesters. This is wrong, and we're going to make sure they can't buy any equipment from any American company. So that did pass and. What happened shortly thereafter is there was a demonstration of, I think it was estimated to 70,000 to 100,000 people in the streets of Hong Kong. And I had put up a, a, a speech online about human rights and protection. And they put it up on these megatrons uh, in the uh, squares where this protest was occurring. So I felt very connected to fighting for the human rights of, of people uh, who were facing oppression from China. Hi, folks. Can you hear me? Good. I can't hear you, though. Oh. You guys muted? I see my friend Jeff. Can you hear me, Ron? Yes, I can hear. Now I can. I could just hear Jeff. Why don't somebody else say something? Kyla, why don't you say something? Hi. Good. Okay. We're all set. I heard you talking to Senator Merkley, so I don't want to interrupt that, and um, I'll participate in any way you'd like. So we do have some questions here, and you can feel free to jump in on any question that you would like to answer. So I think now, now, that sounded like Grace, but it was very... Yeah, I think this is Grace <laughs> with Senator Wyden's office. Hi, Ron. Familiar Hello. face? Okay. Um, I think we're having a little hard. I see in the chat too. I'm sorry for the host. It's, it, it sounds like the audio cut back a little bit. And I, I think I'm having a hard time hearing some, some of you. Okay. How is this audio? Can you hear us okay now? Yeah, that helps. Okay. We'll just try to make sure to talk real loud. <laughs> Get real cozy. Um, so yes, thank you once again, both of our senators for joining. We're going to continue with our questions now from our student host and uh, feel free to jump on and answer any one that you like. Jeff, did you talk about health care for students and mental health and the like? No, uh, Ron, they've only asked one, the panel has asked one question so far, which was if we wanted to start by talking about a, a bill that we've gotten passed that we were particularly pleased about this past year. And I mentioned the Hong Kong Crowd Control Act. And they were just in, just as you got on, they were inviting you to share, share the same. And then they're planning to go on to other questions. Good. I think probably for the community, what I was pleased about is I was able to get legislation passed to make available an extra $600 per week in unemployment benefits for a four month period at the at the height of the, the COVID pandemic. And that was so important for communities where you had a lot of African-Americans and Hispanics, BIPOC community, people just couldn't, they couldn't pay rent and couldn't pay groceries without it. So um, we have to make choices about legislation. And people came up to me and said, that was the biggest program to promote opportunity for people who don't have power and, and, and clout and communities of color that we've seen in years and years. So I think that provided um, real help um, to students um, who were you know, just worried about being able to have a roof over their head and be able to have their family buy groceries. Another question we have is uh, what helps you decide on how to vote on a bill? Go ahead, Jeff. 
Well, so uh, <laughs> the often what happens is you have the bill, but you also have a lot of amendments, and you have to decide uh, on each each piece of that. So the the staff team, each of us has a sizable team that gets the text of the amendment or the bill runs through it, kind of writes out a list of pros and cons. Uh, I read through that, then I discuss it with my staff. If it's an issue that somebody, I have somebody I know who I think might have good perspective on, I call them up, I get their thoughts on it. Uh, sometimes I check in with Ron's office, what his thoughts are or other senators uh, teams and and just kind of mull over the, the pros and, and, and cons. Uh, I want to bring kind of a reasoned judgment. I, I need to be able to explain to myself and explain to everyone else on any particular bill why I thought that on balance uh, I should support or oppose that piece of legislation. What both of us have done uh, is had hundreds and hundreds of town meetings where we just kind of throw open the doors and give anybody who'd like to the chance to come. Of course, during the COVID period, we've had to do more virtual um, town meetings. So um, we're doing a lot of that again to try to uh, provide uh, opportunities for uh, people to be heard. Also what we've done, and I thought it up years ago because there was a government shutdown that was so stupid and the senators behaved in such a juvenile way that the press asked me what I was gonna do. And I said, I'm gonna go home and talk to some people who actually act like adults. And they said, who are that? And I, who, who, who are those people? And I said, they're the high school students of Oregon. And we began a program, Jeff's been good enough to participate called Listening to the Future. So we get out and we um, just have opportunities for high school students to just talk about you know, their issues. And sometimes we actually have um, had a town meeting where half the room was high school students. The meeting was at the high school. Half the um, meeting was high school students. Half the meeting was community members. And it's been really a good dialogue. Here, here's what's going on, folks, and I don't know if Jeff's having this problem, but the student speakers, their voice is so faint at this um, point. Um, I'm having know, trouble hearing you as well. Have you had trouble, Jeff? Yeah. yeah. So if, if, if our students can speak up or perhaps adjust their technology, that would be great. I see some students with face shields and um, I'm wondering if one or two of you have, your voice has been very faint. I'm not sure. What have you done to support youth in the past with mental health, education and or workforce support? I, I did catch that. That was regard to mental health issues, and um, I'm I'm happy to jump in here, Ron, if if, if that's appropriate. I got it. go go. So everywhere I go, and Ron mentioned we both of us go to every county every year to talk with folks, and beforehand we hold a meeting with the county commissioners, the city mayors, the school board members, and so forth. Mental health comes up more and more, uh, even before COVID struck. But uh, COVID has greatly accentuated the mental health problems. Isolation depresses people. Uh, humans are, we're social. We need, we need contact with others. And it's uh, made people stressed about the future and that affects uh, mental health. Stressed about finances because they've been losing, losing jobs, worried about picking up an infection, affecting their own health, worried about passing on infection to family members. So stress from, from every direction. And um, there's something else going on in the mental health world that I was, I was meeting with um, school counselors from Ben Lapine, and they said that they're seeing a lot more mental health issues for our younger students in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. And that part of that is the role of technology, uh, that uh, children are spending less time kind of playing with other children and more time playing with uh, cell phone games. And that that lack of socialization is, is affecting ability to function in a, in a group. 
And then last week I was meeting with a whole selection of student uh, counselors from across the state. And they said um, uh, that uh, kids isolated in their homes uh, while the schools are shut down, uh, just lots and lots of, of issues are erupting. I had put forward a bill called Elementary and Secondary School Counseling Act that would have greatly increased the ratio of student counselors in, in American schools by helping low income schools have at least one counselor for every 250 students, which most schools do not, do not have. Uh, in our uh, COVID bill, one of the things that I pushed for was uh, $80 million in additional funding for mental health and for suicide prevention hotlines. So people can reach out and talk to somebody when they're feeling really stressed. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is a real concern. And I've been suggesting to our superintendents across the state, we've got to create as many ways for students to be involved as possible. Maybe for example, when kids are at home and trying to do online work, but there's kind of no structure for it, that they could instead, the school could set up workstations appropriately spaced, supervised in a gymnasium or in a cafeteria. So there'd be a place to go to and you're around other people and you're not isolated in the same way. Maybe they could do uh, some sports that don't involve contact. I don't know, like, like cross country or and more online stuff like, I don't know, speech or chess clubs, but things that kind of add to the fabric because right now, uh, mental health of our students is really, really declining and um, I, we got to get through this COVID and get back to a normal rhythm, which won't happen until we have an effective vaccine. But meanwhile, um, there, while there's risks of, of being in a school setting, there's also risks of being isolated and, and mental health is one of them. Um, this is an enormously important issue to both of us. I'm a, a co-sponsor of the bill that Senator Merkley talked about, a very important bill for um, counselors. And for me, this issue is deeply personal and um, very much in my obligations representing Oregon in the Senate. My brother suffered from schizophrenia. Not a day went by for years on end when he was on the street, uh, when he wasn't on the street, we were worried that he was gonna hurt himself or somebody else. And uh, he was far and away the smartest of the Wyden kids. And um, so this is deeply personal to me. And also um, my responsibilities in the Senate is I'm the senior Democrat on a committee that funds healthcare. And we're working now on a very aggressive, very focused approach to deal with racial disparities in our country's healthcare system, mental health, and everything else, because I think the evidence is just overwhelming. You see it with COVID, for example, is the COVID rates are much lower in affluent white suburbs. They're much lower there than they are in um, communities where folks are modest income, African-Americans, Hispanics, communities of, of color, they get far fewer healthcare services than those white affluent communities. And I'm determined, particularly if I'm the chairman of this committee in January to change that. And we would very much welcome um, all of you uh, in terms of participating uh, with it. I've also been um, one of the ringleaders on getting specifically a three digit number and it's um, basically a project that's just now getting underway 988 um, lines for life in our state really has focused on that it's largely to a great extent got young people volunteering there so if you would like to work with Senator Merkley and I this would be another project that we could work on um, together because I think what we know is that when someone reaches that point of desperation where they are thinking about taking their life, we've just got to have the strongest advocate, the most thoughtful professional on the other end of the phone 
to make sure that they know that there are uh, better and peaceful um, ways to deal with the issues that, that they're, str they're struggling with. But this is an issue that's personal to me because of my brother. And um, one of the things that I'm going to make sure during um, our opportunity, should we have it next, starting next Tuesday, to be in charge of the Senate is rooting out these um, racial injustices in American healthcare where mental health, along with every other program, has serious um, limitations that need to be fixed. Thank you for your answers. And I just wanna share a note to both of our senators. We will continue to ask our questions aloud, but if you continue to have a hard time hearing us, you can also see the questions in the chat box. Now we can hear you. Okay, good. <laughs> but we'll have the chat box ready to go as a backup as well. So thank you. And we're gonna go ahead with our next question. Yeah. Do you think education concerning personal financial literacy should be required for all students? Why or why not? Well, my answer to that is absolutely yes. Uh, when you, you know, I spent a lot of time working with Habitat for Humanity uh, here in, in Oregon, where I was the, the director and we were enabling families who were homeless or near homeless, had been living in vans and basements and so forth, to be able to buy a house. And they put in their, their down payment was in the form of sweat equity. That is, they went out and spent 400 hours working on the, on the house. Got to know these families well. And... Um, Part of what we had as we worked with the families was a financial education class. And it was one of the most important things for the families to be able to manage finances so that they could hold on to their house, so they could make their monthly payments. The payments were very low because there was no interest and the houses were sold at the cost of the land and the, and the materials. So it was a great deal. But even so, things like um, high interest strategies like payday loans that, that charge 300% and, and how they can suck you into a vortex of debt and destroy your family, or the incredible price you pay on uh, some strategies that are promoted like, like layaways with really high interest rates or, or credit cards that completely rip, rip you off. One of the things that you, is true in America is it costs a lot to be poor. In other words, somebody with a home could borrow maybe at 3%, and yet here's somebody who doesn't own a home is having to borrow at 300%. It's like absolutely outrageous. Or if you don't have a bank account, you have to, to pay to get your check converted to cash. And then if you need a credit card, you have to pay to get your cash converted back to a, uh, putting money on a, on a um, card. And so um, kind of understanding those, those financial issues and, and how to get the best deal. Uh, so you get the most bang out of the buck for, for every dollar, your hard earned dollar you have is, is really a, a foundation that everybody should have when they go through high school. I, I certainly agree with that. Everybody up on taxes and how simple and uncomplicated they are? I'm kidding. Taxes are one of the biggest and most complicated programs imaginable. And this is something that um, the committee were on the senior Democrat um, deals. And to give you an idea how complicated it is, there is a very extensive program run by the government that basically has people get help so they don't face any charge in filling out their taxes. Well, the commercial companies have made it so confusing that people can't even figure out how to get it. So we've been trying to rein them in and get the word out to everybody that there really are ways in which for free, if you're a family of modest means, you can get uh, help. And I think this will be something that a President Biden and Senator Merkley and I will uh, work on uh, and get sorted out. But you know, whether it is taxes, whether it's payday loans, 
Um, another area that I'm going to focus on is uh, more understandable medical bills, because a lot of these bills that you get, I mean, you, you practically you know, have to be a wizard to sort this out. So I think, uh, yes. Part of the question on financial literacy, one of the things I thought about is, well, the federal government could make the funds available and then maybe students and school boards and the like could have um, some role in actually planning the programs. But I think it's very important that we have those. I apologize. I didn't. I couldn't. We lost your voices again. What laws can you pass to further students' success in school? Chris, Chris is cupping his hand to his ear, so everybody is having the same challenge. Did that have something to do with what we have we done to promote um, success for students at school? Good, go ahead, Jeff, and then I'll pick up. Well, so there's a, a bill that's called Rebuild America Schools Act, which is about uh, uh, investing in the infrastructure. So you don't have schools with the water coming down in the middle of the library or the hallway or asbestos problems or lead in the drinking water, so on and so forth. So that's just a physical infrastructure. The um, uh, class sizes make a huge difference. So I've written a, a bill called Smaller Class Sizes for Students in Education Act. Uh, I think about how my first grade class down in uh, Roseburg had about 20 students and my son's first grade class had 34. How's a teacher? I mean, I, when, when my children were small and we'd have uh, just five or six uh, six-year-olds here, it'd be crazy. And I think, how can a teacher deal with 34 five and six year olds in, in first grade. So smaller class sizes. One of the things that I've really appreciated is something called TRIO. And TRIO is about helping students who are first in their family to go to college. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the, I'm the, the first in my family to ever go to college. And um, uh, maybe, you know, how about if some of you raise your hands if you would be the first in your, your family to go to college? I see some hands, hands raised. Uh, it's, um, it's a huge leap because you don't grow up hearing about it. How does it work? How do the applications work? How do you make that transition? So the TRIO programs are all about working with students while you're in high school uh, to get a sense of that world that you don't really know from your family because your family hasn't gone to college. And that program didn't exist when I was in high school and I wish it had because I found it really a huge, huge cultural leap. I, I arrived at college and found out everybody else in my dorm had visited the college beforehand, it never even occurred to us. I mean, us, my, my parents, myself, it never occurred to us that you would actually go and visit a college before arriving. Like, who had the money to do that? Uh, so it was just a whole different different world. Uh, the um, Also, I really want to see a strength in our CTE program, our current technical education, because college is not the right path for, for everyone. Uh, one of my son's best friends is becoming an electrician, and he got in with the uh, IBEW um, International Electrical Workers uh, for, a, and he gets paid to learn the craft. And if he, you know, when you do it in high school and you have wood shop, electric shop, so on and so forth, it helps pave the way for some really fulfilling, good paying careers that don't involve college. So those are some of the things. And then finally, for those who go to college, it has to be debt free. I mean, it is crazy the financial gauntlet, gauntlet we're putting people through. Uh, when I started college, you could go to a public university in Oregon. And if you were so lucky as to get a full-time job in the summer you, at minimum wage, you could pay your tuition. So college debt really wasn't an issue. If it wasn't an issue some almost 40 years ago, uh, it shouldn't be an issue today because college is that much more in, important for so many career pathways. So um, just a few additional kind of points. I got a law passed with Barack Obama during the Every Student Succeeds Act that I'm going to use as kind of a mirror for going forward. And that 
is that when students have low graduation rates, we really need to think through more creatively why that's the case. And I'm not proud of it, but I went to school on a basketball scholarship. I was dreaming of playing in the NBA. That was a ridiculous idea because at 6'4", I was too small and I made up for it by being really, really slow. So I wasn't gonna to get to play in the NBA. But basketball is kind of what kept me in school. I'm not sure I would have, you know, I didn't pay much attention. I'm not proud of it anyway. And so under the proposal that Barack Obama helped me with, we basically set aside extra money for school districts with low graduation rates. And that way you can try and find a way to come up with ideas to make it attractive for students to stay you know, engaged. And Jeff mentioned the CTE program. I'm very supportive of that. I also do a lot of work with um, technology. So I think it's a very good thing for um, schools to be working with technology companies and you can learn about artificial intelligence and you can learn about algorithms and all kinds of things if that is um, more suited um, to your interests. So um, there's one other thing and that is, I believe it's gonna be really important that we get back to having more school related health services for kids. I mean, we ought to have more student health centers when we get the vaccine and everybody's back to school. And we're also talking about opportunities for nurses and others to get in the community and visit with families at their home. Because if we're gonna get on top of this, you know, COVID, you know, issue, we just want to deal with the fact that families of modest income communities of color. I think I got, I think I got that reaction. Um, it sounds like a frog. Um, but the point is, I think med student medical services in school at home also should be a big part of what we seek to do in the future because I think it's a major barometer of a student's success. Thank you, Senator Ryder and Senator Markley. Um, just a real quick reminder before we move on um, that we are here with both of our senators. We're weak and we have an opportunity, a phenomenal opportunity for our students who can in to ask questions of our Oregon senators. So we're gonna move on to some more questions that our student host will provide. But I want to invite our students, if you have not already, to type in your questions into our chat with your name. And in about 10 minutes, we'll be circling back to your questions so that we can open up the discussion and hear your voices at, this, at that time. So just another reminder to our students, you're more than welcome to type in your questions into the chat, and we will be circling back to them in about 10 minutes. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining. So we have a couple more questions. How do you engaging with youth to get involved politically and create policy? And what are other opportunities that we should know about our students? I, I got hardly any of that. It had something to do with college, but I didn't get it. politically and create policy. Good. Good. And what are other opportunities that we should know about as students? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, Ron mentioned the special effort that uh, his team put together to hold conversations directly with students. And those have been really a joy. 
Uh, and um, I remember that uh, my first interaction with a politician was was when I was in high school and I took a, a politics class and our local state representative came and spoke to us. And we really asked some tough questions and he didn't have very many good answers. And I thought, hmm, maybe that's a job I could do. <laughs> and I, I thought, what a cool, what a cool idea that you represent people and try to build better policies uh, to make a better world. Uh, and, um, and so that was a little seed in the back of my mind. It, 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 didn't, it took uh, many, many uh, decades before it, that seed sprouted, but it was there. One of the things that really changed my life was an internship. Uh, and um, for the life of me, I have no idea how I, I found out about this, but in my sophomore year of college, I heard that some people were doing internships in Washington, D.C. with, with their senators. And I thought, well, that would be incredible. Uh, so I, I, um, I wrote to uh, four senators I'd heard about who are, that I'd been really impressed by. Uh, and uh, one of them was uh, uh, Ted Kennedy and another was Daniel Inouye from Hawaii. Uh, and, um, and then I wrote to my home state senators, and one of my home state senators said, yes, uh, the interviewed me, his uh, chief of staff interviewed me. And, and uh, so internships are a great way uh, to um, uh, be able to go and broaden your, your world. It just, you aren't expected to know a lot at the beginning, you just expected to, to work hard, show up and work hard, ask lots of questions and be diligent and you, you learn so much. And that summer I spent uh, in Senator Hatfield's office was really terrific. But here's the thing. I had no money, so I, I arranged to uh, house sit. Uh, I was eating the free food all over the Capitol, wherever there was a reception. Uh, and I know how hard it is when people don't have resources uh, to be able to do something like, like, like that. Um, I took advantage of the $50 bus ticket across America, again, to make it uh, cheaper to get there. Uh, but uh, I am trying to, I'm, I don't have pay for all my interns, but I now have pay for a bunch of my interns and specifically people who come from financially challenged uh, uh, backgrounds. And uh, so there is pay for some, some of these positions. And uh, talking to student counselors about those opportunities, I'd really encourage you to, to, to think about that because if you get a chance to explore your idea, maybe you want to you can get an internship with a help help oversee what's happening at a medical facility if you're interested in health or or etc. It just um, that real life experience outside the classroom can turn on the light bulb and get you a lot more excited than just just sitting at a desk or behind a computer. And what we can do sometimes when you have a particular interest in an issue can be pretty surprising. I'll tell you just briefly that. At a recent town meeting, a young woman named Eva Jones came, and she was really angry about Congress not doing anything about gun violence. And she said, you know, we can't vote yet, Senator, but we're going to be able to vote someday, and we're going to be able to watch you. And she said, we've just had it. We've had it with all of this violence and having to do drills where we get all scrunched up into, you know, closets and all this kind of thing. We expect some people to do something about it. She made good points and the audience clapped. And I said, Eva, those were really good points. And I said, I'll be in touch with you. And she looked like, yeah, fat chance a senator is going to call me. That's not going to happen. So we all went back to Washington and we were in some meetings talking about gun violence. And I said, I just heard from a young woman at one of our meetings. She made a great, great presentation. I said, I'd like to bring her back to Washington. And uh, everybody said, great. You know, if you guys have heard of somebody really represent youth on gun violence, bring her back. So I got on the phone. I remember it like this. I said, hi, Eva. This is Ron Wyden calling from Washington, DC. And she said, yeah, right. And I said, nope, Eva, it's really me. And the senators would like you and your mom to get on a plane next week and come on back to Washington, D.C. and talk about gun violence. And she did. And she made a great presentation and she was on national TV. So, you know, what we try to do is 
Senator Merkley said is look for every way we possibly can, whether it's listening to the future or internships or trying to convince you that it's actually us on the phone when we call you and we'd like to get you involved to make sure that the voice of young people um, is really, really heard. I've got something I call the Oregon Way. And I think having more young people involved in, in government, just as it was with Jeff when he heard somebody come to one of his classes and the guy didn't sound like he was very informed. Jeff said, I could do it as well as that person can. So um, we want you to feel uh, that you can participate. Our staff is on the phone. Um, Grace is here from my office. I said, no, Senator Merkley has staff um, on the phone. Who's- um, a, Terry, and, Terry is here from my team. Terry, so um, you guys can call them nights and weekends and take every bit of their free time and make sure they're responsive to students. That's a joke. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Me neither. Um, what could you vote on to help mental health of students? Well, uh, just to uh, very quickly, I mentioned a few things before on mental health that I think would be very relevant. My, my bill to provide a lot more mental health counselors uh, it's been endorsed by kind of everyone in the school world like, yes, 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 we need more, we need more counselors. And then I think right now with COVID, uh, we really have to be more imaginative about connecting with students. Uh, this isolation is really a big problem. So finding uh, activities that can be done online and activities can be done in person, including having work study areas in the cafeterias or the gymnasium so students aren't, aren't left at, at home. And then having those crisis lines for, the, for people to be able to uh, reach out with. So those are, those are the main ideas that I have. Here are a couple of additional things, and, um, and this goes beyond what we talked about um, earlier. I think some of these big insurance companies are trying to take advantage of some of the challenges with COVID, and I'll tell you how. Right now, there's supposed to be a law that says that um, mental health should get treated just the same as physical health. In other words, mental health is as high a priority as if you hurt your knee or something like that. Well, that's the law. But the insurance companies are trying to get around the law so that if they sell you a policy and the insurance company gives the business to some other business, a contractor or something, the other business doesn't honor its obligations. And so I've got some people at the Oregon Health Sciences Center helping me to crack down on these insurance companies because I think these insurance companies are denying families who have paid for mental health benefits and paid for fair treatment for mental health with everything else. They're not being treated fairly. The second thing that I'm doing, which I think you're gonna hear a lot about next year because it relates to police is have any of you heard about this program where Oregon's in the lead called CAHOOTS? Anybody ever heard of CAHOOTS? CAHOOTS is basically when you've got tensions on the streets and somebody probably has more of a mental health concern than is doing something where they're gonna commit a violent crime, you could use mental health counselors to help them out. And Oregon is kind of pioneering it in Eugene and Portland. And I've actually proposed a law that would expand this by putting this into the Medicaid program, which is the area that I touched on earlier, the big program for healthcare for people of modest means. It's called CAHOOTS. And um, I think it is a really good Oregon description because it means kind of we're all in it together. We're in CAHOOTS. That's what we're doing in Oregon to help people. 
Hills Park Senators for being available to take our questions. At this time, I would like to transition to our chat um, and just welcome our students to ask questions. Our first question comes from Ashad, and he has asked, I was wondering what's being done for minority students that don't have access to internet. What is being done for minority students at this time who do not have access to internet? So I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, the, the bill that we passed before distributed funds to state and local government. And part of the, the goal of the education component was to basically empower school districts because every Every school in Oregon is governed by a school board, and we've got basically 200 school districts, enable them to take on this challenge of getting the equipment and places where broadband can be used. It's, it's, it's tough though, uh, right? Because um, uh, like I've been ta talking to teachers who uh, are finding it hard to find some of their students. Uh, other times uh, they found their students, but their students just are not signing in for, for classes. And it's just part of the chaos of, of the period. Like they have the broadband, they have the laptop, but still it's like, it's like, it's hard to be motivated to, to sign in. Um, uh, one, um, one of the counselors on the counselor call I held said some uh, about 30% of the students are flunking their classes right now when they have the technology. Uh, so um, the, the, the goal at the federal level was get resources to the school districts and the school districts to get laptops and help students set up workstations, uh, get broadband. Uh, one of the things that uh, my bill did is it would have paid for uh, setting up uh, broadband and continue, so the initial setup costs and then paid for it for families who were low income families through the end of the COVID cri crisis so that broadband in the home was paid for. We have other places in the state where there isn't the broadband available. And that raises a whole nother set of challenges on, on how you get a good connection that you can do this type of communication, Zoom room style communication. So federal resources, local action, uh, and just persistent effort by teachers and counselors to reach out and try to create that connection. Years ago, really in the last century, before you all were born, our country made a really big decision. We basically said that electricity and water, these were like essential needs. It was like, um, in effect, a, a public utility, an essential um, utility. And uh, I'm going to do everything I can in this upcoming Congress to basically say that's what we need to do again, this time with broadband. And basically say that everybody should have access to broadband, no matter what their zip code is. Because my concern is and this is part of the technology approach um, that I've been involved in, is that if we continue along these lines, we're gonna have an information aristocracy where the families that are really well off, they're gonna have high speed, but I mean, that's just the beginning. They are gonna have the fruits of the technology treasure you know, trove and folks with modest income are practically going to be back in dial-up days. And our committee is going to have a big bill for what's called infrastructure, roads and bridges and transportation systems. And I'm going to try to say, all right, it's time now to really make a, a clear line in the sand here and say, in the last century, we did it for electricity and water, it's time to do it for modern connectivity. And I can tell you, having just driven around the state, Jeff and I have been out with the fires and having town meetings in Eastern Oregon and like so many parts of our state don't have internet access. 
And that's just not good enough. We, we can get this done. And I think I have a way to pay for it. I want to give our students um, listening in a little bit more time. If any of you have any questions, we definitely want to hear from you. Your voice matters, and this is an awesome opportunity to exercise that voice. I want to give a couple more minutes um, to make sure there's ample time for folks to type those questions in before we transition to our close. I don't see any new questions popping in. Okay, we have one now. Um, okay, so this question comes from Edmund. She is asking, what are you doing to make school more diverse in Oregon? Again, that question is, what are you doing to make school more diverse in Oregon? So, uh, so let me ponder that a little bit. Uh, our school systems are set up by by districts. Uh, the um, uh, I live in the east edge of Portland. Uh, when I was uh, going to school here, it's a blue collar neighborhood. Uh, it was probably ninety percent, ninety five percent white. Uh, a, a few Black Americans, a few Asian Americans, a few Hispanic Americans, but very few. It is now majority minority. My children went to the same schools I went to and they saw a full rainbow, people from around the world and people of every ethnicity from across America. Uh, it wasn't really the result of policy, however, that made the school more diverse. Uh, it was because uh, it was affordable housing in this community. So, so people moved into the community. Uh, the, so housing policy has a huge impact on where people live and a huge impact on, on essentially creating uh, class divisions and racial divisions in, in America. So we need to have housing policy that puts affordable housing into every neighborhood. I think that that creates a, then a much uh, greater economic mix of students in our public schools and a much greater uh, racial mix in our public schools as well. I think it's just healthy all the way around instead of having a, a really rich and predominantly white uh, school district and then uh, a school district where people are concentrated who are, are all coming from a position of, of, of poverty, uh, much, much better to be engaged together. The um, uh, housing policy is uh, desperately needed, huge investments in affordable housing, uh, because uh, essentially we see homelessness growing by leaps and bounds. I spent years um, with Habitat for Humanity, as I mentioned, and then developing affordable housing. And it was just like, like putting a drop in the bucket when you needed a swimming pool. Uh, and we see the effects now with people living in tents uh, all over creation because they can't afford a, a place to live. So I guess that's one idea I'd throw forward is uh, tackle the problem in part uh, through housing. I, I think um, Senator Merkley makes a good point. I'm gonna just mention a piece of legislation I'm going to introduce shortly after the new year. It's called the DASH Act, the Decent, Affordable, Safe Housing Act. And it stems from exactly what Senator Merkley talks about is, you know, if we have so many young people who don't have a roof over their head and couch surfing and getting picked up you know, in taxis because they don't have an actual place to stay. You can't possibly have justice and, and opportunity to uh, get ahead. Um, the first part of the bill that I just mentioned, the housing bill, um, is going to focus on the fact that the housing director in Oregon told me that she knew of school districts where poor kids were picked up by a school bus in the morning from the forests 
because they had been out in the forest, in the parks all night and they were wet and cold and then they were expected somehow to get to school and to learn. So housing equity and housing fairness is hugely important. I also think that what we'll do, 100% of your United States senators, you have two of them, so you've got 100%. Um, we're gonna try to do more to link the housing with the needed services that allow diverse communities to have a chance to get healthcare and don't live in food deserts and can secure housing and have a variety of, of ways to um, give their family a chance. So I would put uh, the housing bill, I would put um, linking the services um, to the housing because if you have a, a good housing place but you're in a food desert, that's not much of a way to plan for the future. So that's an uh, important part of it. And then I mentioned the question of, of racial justice in healthcare. I think this healthcare system is so out of whack. And I actually brought together my colleagues on this committee that has jurisdiction over healthcare. And I was stunned. I knew there were a lot of examples, but it, they went on for example after example after example of really unacceptable discrimination against communities of color in healthcare. And that clearly hampers the opportunities for people to get ahead in a diverse community. So um, this is Grace with Senator Wyden's office. So sorry to interrupt, Senator. Um, I think you've, you've got to actually hop off very soon, but I just wanted to quickly um, introduce myself. I'm happy to stay on and chat for a little bit if folks want to stick on a little longer. Um, I'm Senator Wyden's field representative, but just wanted to, apologies for interrupting, um, wanted to flag that. Um, what, what's your schedule, Jeff? Do you want to make some um, closing remarks or just say thanks and then I'll do the same? Uh, I, I do have to go as well. So I'll, I'll just close with a, a topic that we haven't talked about, which is taking on systemic racism. And we really need to pass the, the bill that Cory Booker and uh, Kamala Harris put forward, Justice and Policing, a bill I was immersed with them on, on several of the key elements to end some of the practices that have just been uh, led to horrific, uh, horrific outcomes. Uh, also, uh, I think it's really important that we pass a, a bill to restore voting rights because one of the major drivers of systemic racism is systemic discrimination in voting. And the Supreme Court has allowed voter intimidation and voter suppression and dark money in campaigns and gerrymandering. And we've got to fix all that so, so people have an equal voice. If you don't have a voice, if you don't have political leverage, then the laws tend to favor those who have the most political power. So we've got to restore grassroots political power. And finally, a, a project I'm working on is to eliminate the slavery through incarceration clause of the 13th Amendment. And if any of you have the chance to watch the documentary, the 13th, I really want to encourage you to do so. Uh, because uh, in high school, I didn't learn about this, that after the Civil War, when slavery was theoretically ended, then what the, what the South did uh, is started arresting people for nothing, convicting them, and then using the incarceration clause to turn them back into slaves. And it was the beginning of mass incarceration, and it was economically devastating to, to families. Uh, it, it just knocked them off their feet for generations to come. And that, that clause, which is an, it's an end to involuntary servitude with the exception of those who are convicted of a crime. And so by convicting people of a crime, they could still have slaves. And um, that, that, that is absolutely has to be torn out of our constitution, uh, horrific consequences. So systemic racism is something we have to fight. We have to fight it in the laws and we have to fight it in our hearts uh, because it exists in, in both places. So with that, thank you all for inviting us to uh, share this dialogue with the panel and with all of, all of you and, and well done. This itself is a good example of interaction with students and I look forward to a lot more of the same. Take care.
Let, let me add just one other thought to Senator Merkley's very important point about systemic racism. And that is Oregon elected officials now have a special responsibility because of our state's ugly history. You know, you may be aware that our state constitution uh, certainly uh, did not in any uh, way deal with uh, questions of racial practices. And we had sundown laws in our state uh, for a period of time. And so unfortunately, this has been an ugly part of Oregon um, history. Also, um, and this is something for a longer um, conversation, the technology laws that I've written have really empowered voices like Black Lives Matter to have a chance to be heard in fighting racist practices. Traditionally, the establishment media wouldn't have been open to those kinds of voices because they always felt that someone would sue them and tie them up and they could be held liable. And under the technology laws that I've written, uh, a lot of those voices of people who don't have power and don't have clout, they can have, have, have a chance to get a video up online and be heard as we've seen in the last few months. So you've had your senators talk about a lot of issues over the last hour um, plus, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'm leaving this conversation beyond saying, let's put this in the to be continued department. Oregon is in really good hands when there are thoughtful students like yourselves raising such important uh, issues in an informed way. So this discussion from my standpoint is over. It's in the to be continued department, okay? All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So just in closing, we definitely want to extend a final word of thanks to both Senator Wyden and Senator Merkley for sharing this space with us and receiving our students' questions. Um, and this, this has definitely been a great experience. I also would like to extend a word of thanks to REIT CEO Lavelle Thomas and Executive Director Mark Jackson for creating a program that elevates student voice and empowers youth to be leaders in their community. It is important for our youth to know and understand that their voice matters and that their insight is considered when it comes to policy development for the well being of their future. For those that are watching, if you would like to support REAP's mission of igniting the next wave of leaders, please visit our website at reapusa.org. Again, that is reapusa.org and become a volunteer or a sustaining donor. Thank you once again, everyone for joining us. And just as a final word, I'm gonna pass it to Michael who just has some closing announcements to share with us all. Yeah. Thanks everyone for tuning into the conversation. Um, we're close to our end time. And uh, just before we close out, uh, here's some announcements. Uh, Elevate the Community is coming up on December 12th. Uh, there is free clothing and food for the community. Uh, What's Fresh every Friday. Uh, the link is on the website at www.reapusa.org forward slash YEP. Uh, you get to learn from entrepreneurs and it's live on Facebook. Uh, our next show is on November 11th. Topic will be human trafficking. Thank you for joining. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you.